So we've got three sofa cushions today. Let's take a look and see what we have. We have a dried finish that's sort of scaly and rough. And we can see where the color is missing here in these lines. And then we have a dark spot. We might want to take care of that. Here's another dark spot here. We want to address that and even out the overall look. Uh, the other thing is on these cushions we can see the fronts are worn, the tops are worn, back to where the backrest cushions cover and here is the original color. So we want to use this area as a guide for our original color. And you can see the same thing here where we have a hint of the original color. So we can refinish the cushion and see if we can match this, leave this unfinished <clears throat> or unrefinished. So they're not too bad, uh, a little bit rough, but not in too bad shape. We can see some markings here where it may have been touched up or those could just be top hide marks that received a little different coloring. Here's some obviously top hide marks. Here's an area where the original color is still rather vivid so we will go up against that and use that for a guide also. So I thought it would be nice before we got started to review some basic principles about reds. And when I do a red couch like this, I will put out every color that I have that pertains to red in any respect whatsoever. Here is true red. Here is brown, which is very reddish. Here is orange course which is yellow and red. This is red oxide. This is red. This is maroon and this is violet. All of these have red in them. So I get to put all these out here and what I'm looking for primarily is a red that has the same darkness in value as the seat. So we'll pick from that something in a similar value. Before we get there though, let's discuss why red is sometimes problematic and why it's always good to stop and reflect a little bit some basic principles regarding red. And that's because reds are quite translucent generally, depending on which red pigment you have, meaning you can see through it to some degree. And if you were to put red on top of a black substrate, you would see through the translucent red and see the black. And that red is not going to look anything like the red you're coloring it. It's going to look more black than red, as a matter of fact. So. How many coats would you have to put to really change the color? Normally you would have to change the color with three coats, but with reds that are translucent, you may never get there. You may put five, six, seven, eight, nine coats <laughs> trying to achieve that red and not get there. And uh, of course by that time your film thickness is built up that it's uh, quite ridiculous. And so uh, the same thing would be true if you had too light of a base, if your substrate was too light, you might run into the same difficulty where your red looks too light and you can't maintain the proper value balance in your colors. Here again, you might help after you put on numerous coats, 
And the more co every coat you put on, it's going to look a little different. So it'll be a very difficult job in trying to find out just what's the right red to spray on there. Because you don't really know until you've put six, seven coats on, then that would be ridiculous. So a lot of uh, exterior automotive paint manufacturers, when they recommend a certain color red, they may recommend a base coat, uh, that is a primer coat, that's uh, maybe more neutral. And so that when you look through the translucent red, it's more middle of the road as far as value is concerned, and that helps you get your red quicker. For some reds, you can even use a metallic base coat. And the metallic base coat has the effect of being mirrors. So that you look through the translucent red and the light bounces off the mirror, comes back through the translucent red, so that the only thing you see is the actual brilliance of the red pigment. So those are some principles that apply with reds, and reds in particular because they tend to be translucent. Now if you're using a premix color, that is a color that's ready to spray, it will have a set pigment concentration, perhaps 18 percent pigment. On the other hand, instead of being stuck at that ratio, if you're using pigments as I am, you can combat that translucent effect by beefing up the pigment concentration just a little bit. Maybe 20 or 22 percent pigment so you get better coverage in less coats. So that's an advantage of pigments. Making your own paints up, beefing up the concentration to get better coverage with less passes. Just a, another reason why we want to review, on this occasion, some basic principles concerning reds. So as I'm preparing here to mix my color, I am looking at uh, various reds. What am I looking at, really? Well, if we looked at the color wheel, we would see red here, and that's to represent the primary color. Uh, which would be the most intense red pigment that we would have. And red is bordered by violet and orange. So red can only go, if we're analyzing our red, our red leather, for example, we're analyzing this in terms of, is this towards the violet or is it towards the orange? And what affects that? The primary colors, blue and yellow, are responsible for changing the red in this direction and yellow in this direction. So therefore reds are often talked about as being either a bluish red that's going in this direction or a yellowish red coming in this direction. So as you're analyzing reds you only have two choices to pick from as far as what kind of a red is it. Which direction is it going? And you'll always do this by comparison. So as I'm analyzing this leather, first of all I'm looking and I'm seeing that this is a bluish red. And as it happens, the maroon is a bluish red. And it's looking very much like a good starting point for me. Not only is it a bluish red, but look at the value of the maroon. Look at the darkness and how it comes very close to the darkness of our leather coating. This would be a good choice then. Because even more than the color, it's the value that's of a concern to us. For example, let's look at this orange. Look at the light value of that orange. If you were to add that light value into into that maroon, it would become so light that you would never, ever, ever get it back to the darkness of our leather. So the value is very important in keeping on track with our leather coating. Now, we have a bluish red 
using our maroon. And notice how in comparison to the bluish red, that this red looks very orange. This red oxide looks like a dark orange. And that orange is a very light orange. Here's brown, which has red in it. Now that's not out of the question yet because the value is close. And here is our true red, which of course has a very dark value. So what I'm thinking of, if I needed to adjust the redness, the true redness of our mix, I think that I could use the darker value true red as a controller for the amount of red. It's orangey more so than the maroon by comparison. But by comparison to these others, it's very red. Here on the bottom is red and above is true red. So the red color is very orangey in comparison to our true red. But by comparison to the maroon, the true red is orangey. It's funny how that works, isn't it? It's always by comparison that we judge the colors. So this red ends up towards the blue on our color wheel, and this red is orangey, and that's, it's affected by the yellow. So right away we could say that these would be a good starting point. We don't need these colors. These, uh, I mean, they're always available, but I don't perceive that we will need those as we adjust uh, the coloration. Now, if we needed it to be darker, sometimes folks want to go straight to black to make it darker. And you know that blacks tend to be bluish or maybe greenish, depending on your black pigment. So this pigment tends to be a bluish black. So if we were to darken our reds using black, we would be contributing in part blue. But that's it. And maybe we don't want our reds to be just bluer. Maybe this is blue enough. But look at the value of the violet here. You see how the violet is almost as dark in value as the black. So what would be the advantage of using violet as our value controller. Well, violet is composed of both red and blue. And so, while we're darkening it, and yes, we're adding some blue, we're also contributing some red to our already red. So, as, whereas black would tend to hide the red, the violet assist in boosting the red because it's composed of red and blue. So this is also a very good principle to keep in mind that violet works very well as a value controller for reds because it in itself contributes some red. So if I were going to mix this color, this is where I would start. I would check how much redness is in there. I would check the darkness that is adjusting the value with violet. Now some people call this purple. As a matter of fact, the real name for this uh, pigment is purple. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know why uh, there's two names for that. Maybe somebody else knows. Maybe, I think the, uh, the technical name is is violet, but purple's okay. Uh, for someone that doesn't uh, have English as their first language, that might be confusing. But you can use either violet or purple, means the same thing. Now, don't get confused with that saying, roses are red, violets are blue, okay? Who was it? Roger Miller finally straightened that out. He said, roses are red, violets are purple, sugar is sweet, and so is maple purple. So yes, violet is purple. Same thing. So this is my starting point for this color. This is faded here. This is a little lighter. 
as we showed you along the back where it was covered with the other back cushion it's a little darker on the sides here it's a little darker so we can use these areas where it wasn't rubbed so thin to get a better color match and uh, we're going to go about doing that now okay so here is my color I'm going to test it right here let me, let me put this here there we go so we can test it right on the couch we'll have a problem with that and protect this I'm going to get another coat on there it really does look bluish here when it's wet but let's see what it looks like dry it down if it is too blue we can always add some of our true red color to that but you never know until it's dry Right, so I'm comparing it to here. Now, this actually looks a bit more yellowish. This is a little bit orangey. So I could even add some of the orangey red in this instance. That orangey red that we said that we may not need. We could add that. But here, looking at the front, uh, I'm not so sure. We definitely a little bit blue from what it looks like on the front. So one of the reds we could boost a little bit, either the true red or, or just the regular red. I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go with the, a uh, little bit more with the true red, I think. Uh, but this would be nice uh, to get started with. I think uh, I would be okay with getting the first coat, uh, the first wiping coat with this. Uh, and so then we'll get a better look too when, when we see how it looks overall. So we know we have some color that we can start with. And uh, now we're going to go about preparing the panels for our wiping color. We'll take this back off. Uh, we're going to clean the seats first and then get ready to get them prepped and get ready to wipe some color in. So we're using a scuff pad for the cleaning. We want to be aggressive with our cleaning. This is not your typical maintenance kind of cleaning. We don't do maintenance cleaning here. The idea, if there's anything at all on the surface that wants to come off, we want to coax it off of there. If there's anything that's going to impede any adhesion, we want to work it on off of there. It's not a maintenance cleaning. It's way more aggressive than that.
Now before I proceed with my prep step, which is going to be using 99% uh, isopropanol, I'm going to sand with 220. Now you can choose what grit, whether it's 400 or 220, but uh, these were very scaly rough seats to begin with. So I'm just going to smooth them out with a little bit of 220. You'll be glad you did because you're going to renew this with such a nice soft feel. And it's important for people to look and see that it's new, but they're always going to touch it. They always will touch it. They want it to feel like new. They see it and then they feel it. And when they feel it, and it passes the field test, then you've got it. All right. Now these cushions look pretty good overall. This one has a couple of areas that we might give a little extra attention to. And such as right here where it's getting worn a bit thin. There and here. So maybe these two lines we could give a little extra attention. I'm going to do that with 220 grit first of all. So we're going to go in here and go down the length of this. And the length of this. Now what I'm doing here is where the finish is cracked. The finish is dried and cracked and brittle. So I'm wanting to feather all of the finish in these areas. I'm wanting to feather it out. And that's what this will do. Now this will also rough up the leather just a little bit in those areas. And that will allow for me to put a little bit of adhesive down into the leather fibers. And I'll be right back with that. So the PVA glue is a good one to use for this kind of an application. Let me make sure we're good here. Here we go. All right. So you want this down into the leather fibers. And you can go both ways to work that on in there and then take it off the surface. This glue does not work well on the flat surface of the leather, but it will work to bind the leather fibers together. And that's what we're aiming for. We'll take the excess here and just leave it in the fibers. that in there off the surface so we don't have a problem with adhesion later. So let's just work on in there nicely and uh, we may or may not need a filler over top that might just be enough right there. Let me hit this one more area
Okay, and that can be drying when we go about uh, starting our color on the other pieces. So we'll be right back for that. Okay, so I've added some of the true red to our mixture. And we're going to give that a whirl here on this first wipe-in try. I failed to mention uh, the three uh, basic uh, principles for making your paints for furniture. Now we talked about pigments, but we didn't talk about the base. Now here the base is uh, 80%, the pigments are 20, and the base is a high gloss base. Why high gloss? Because for the intense colors, you don't want to mask the intenseness by using the regular base, which is a satin base. As soon as you deviate from the high gloss, you start adding components into the base that take it toward the matte finish. Now a matte finish would be whitish, right? It would whiten down a little bit in order to kill the sheen. So that particular whiting effect of the flattener is somewhat present in the satin finish. That's the halfway point. So you got matte, satin, and then high gloss. So we don't want any of the flattener effect at all in our brilliant red colors. They will dampen the appearance of the red to the point where it's like you can never get the depth of red. The whitening effect of any flattener additives will make your red look pinkish and you can never bring it up to the darkest red. And usually when you're working with reds like this, the darkness is your main struggle. And so that does have an effect on the value. We talked about using a pigment of the right value. If we're going to tint it, we want the red of the right value. If we're going to darken it, we want violet, right? So we're, we're keeping the dark value in all of our choices for coloration. And so we have to have the same consideration for the base. It needs to be able to reveal the true value of our pigments and not diminish the value with any whiting flatteners in them. So that's, uh, that's the main thing. The other thing is too, and we've talked about this before, for sofa cushions, you're going to have a lot more flexibility than you would for automotive. Whereas a regular base might be fine for automotive because there's a very firm cushion there, this cushion is more giving. So you want to add an extra flex additive for your furnitures. Also the third thing is crosslinker. So we're going to work this paint into all of these little crevices here. And we want as much holding power as we possibly can because we're not putting any other repair materials in here. The color has to do all of the adhesion. It has to also serve to some degree some of the structural support here. It doesn't call for any extra structural support, but we definitely want our color to contribute there. So that's, that's why the crosslinker in our base coat. So let's give this a try. We don't know how the color is going to look overall until we get a, a coat wiped in and get it dried down, but you're along for the ride with me. We want plenty of color because the color is providing the hydraulic pressure here to get this pushed deep into these crevices and deep into the grain. We can't wipe it dry because that would be only on the surface. So just wipe it wet and let the hydraulic pressure push that color in. And then we'll let that dry and uh, we'll come back with another coat.
Okay, I've got enough in the cup for a second wipe-in coat. Remember, red is rather translucent, so do we have the right color or not? See, and we don't know because we need a couple of coats on here before we get a really good eye on it. We really don't know the depth of our color. We don't know how dark it's going to be. So let's uh, make that judgment with this second coat. So this is the end of our second coat which is covering kind of well. But if we notice here this strip is darker where the backrest cushions came over. So I still could go darker that is adding violet. Uh, I could go darker with our color. Uh, the question though still remains what do the backrest cushions look like because we don't have them. Are the backrest cushions lighter just like this? Or are they in fact a little bit darker because they haven't got abraded so much? So maybe we could uh, go halfway Let's add some of the violet to darken the value of our red, even if we have to boost the true red in it again after adding the violet. So that's our next goal. Here's a dab of the new color. Let's see what it looks like. Well, it's still light. Maybe some of the reddish brown would help. Well, the reddish brown was too light in value to even be considered, so this is a little bit of black. And that put us right on. That's the darkness that we needed. So that's a go, just a few drops of black. All right, so we've got our final color ready to spray, but before we do that, we've wiped in two coats here, and if there's any debris in here at all from the wipe in, we want to settle that right now. So use whatever you see fit to use. I'm going to use some 600 grit. Now to smooth that out to give it a nice final touch. So just something light. Any nibs that happen to be present, it'll just knock them free and boy what a difference already. What a difference. We just get a little bit of alcohol on a rag and let it uh, dry just a little bit and use that for a tack rag. As you can see it melts everything together. So we're going to load up the gun with the new color and be right back.
So now we're going to be ready for our clear coat. And I would suggest to always use a separate gun for the clear coat if you possibly can. Set it up like this where you can you can set it up when you need to. And uh, can you guess what I used uh, for my clear? What are the ingredients in my clear coat? If you watch the channel for a while, you probably guessed I'm using the high gloss clear and I've got cross linker in it and I have a little bit of flex additive added to it since it's a sofa cushion and I have some slip additive so the slip additive will prevent uh, anything from sticking to the surface and it's especially helpful if people are going to be sliding out of the couch when you slide out you don't want to grab and yank on the coating you want to slide across the coating it'll also help with any spills uh, it'll help repel anything uh, from from sticking to the couch any food stuff like we saw on there so it'll be just as though we had uh, top coated it with some some sort of an oil or something it'll feel uh, slippery like that so that's what we're going to do here we're going to put the clear coat on and uh, when that cures it's going to feel nice and slippery and uh, you'll slide out of it it'll really look uh, like brand new Okay, so I don't know if they're dry yet, but we're about to wrap this up. Let's take a look at our repair. So here's our line. You can see the line here, that one, and this one. And then we did one up here somewhere. It might have been here, this one. Maybe I could go in a little closer. Let's see if we can. Oh yeah, there we go. And let's, let's see about this. Okay. So here's this line. Here's this one. There's not much of a line left there. And here. I think this is this is dry. not totally dry yet but anyway those repairs look good and we didn't have to do a tremendous amount to them just uh, keep it simple keep it clean keep the adhesive off the surface and it's a good job anyway thanks for watching so here's a tech tip if you happen to get some graphics that are too large for example for this button make it even on the contours here and then on the straight part leave it overhang a little bit and then you can take a, a new razor blade and just trim it like this and like this and that way you'll get a nice fit and you won't have to worry about anything hitting or wrinkling just like that and here's the other one same thing put a nice fit around the contoured parts and on the straight edge let it overhang just trim that and trim that and then you have a nice perfect fit and everybody will be happy down the road